Um, and our last speaker for this morning is Lin Zhao Chang um, from Johns Hopkins, and he will be presenting his work on genome editing in human stem cells for blood diseases, sorry, blood disease modeling and treatment. Forward. Yep. Okay. And then there's a separate. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay. So, okay. Um, can we go back to my uh, oh, the oh, first slide? Right okay. Back. Thank you. Okay. The, the first, I would like to thank the stem cell committee for providing me the opportunity to sh uh, share with you um, something we did in the past. Um, I'm sorry, the, um, several uh, uh, um, years, uh, as required by the meeting organizer, and it uh, disclosed uh, some of the uh, relationship with uh, the, the biotech company there. Currently, I'm serving as the scientific advisory board member for Wicom uh, Bio uh, USA. Uh, Wicom Bio is the biggest public trade company in China for the cell and the gene therapy. Also serve as the SAB member for Shenzhen Cell Inspired uh, the Biotechnology. And, and more uh, recently, I serve as a scientific co-founder and SAB, SAB chair for Argo um, Biotechnology. The company is supposed to uh, commercialize the technology that uh, developed at uh, the Hopkins. Uh, for the uh, red blood cell as for transfusion the, the medicine the, and the drug um, delivery, as well as for the stem cell and derived exosome for cell uh, the therapy and the, the biologics. I, I, at this moment, I will focus on the original title. So if you are interested with the exosome, there will be a session in the afternoon, the education. Uh, the section. All the potential conflict of interest is uh, managed by the Johns Hopkins uh, Office of Technology Transfer here. So uh, now I'm going to the, the scientific uh, uh, the part of my talk. You already hear from the, the previous talk, and this is pretty much the, the dogma for the hematopoiesis, uh, starting from the, the multipotent hematopoietic stem cells on the top of that, and then with the stepwise the uh, the, pro, uh, the, uh, the manners they, they generate uh, all the, uh, the red blood cells, the platelet from the, the megakaryocyte, T cells and B cells, and the other um, cells type here. So uh, many of us have been working on trying to expand the transplantable hematopoietic stem cells in the past 20 or 25 years. At least I, I have been working on for 25 years. We made a lot of progress, but still the, the challenging and the level of expanding the transplantable hematopoietic stem cells. So we have the window of opportunity that we can couch them for a week. Maybe we can expand them for five to tenfold, and then the the transplantable activity uh, reduced here. So that's the opportunity for the, the gene uh, therapy you have heard in the past uh, 10 years or so. Uh, in comparison, you have heard the embryonic stem cell, and more recently, the induced the pluripotent stem cell. Not only they are pluripotent, but also they are immortal. So uh, the nowadays, uh, we can easily reprogram the human somatic cell, for example, the cell from the, the blood into the uh, iPS cells. This cell can be cultured under uh, a very highly uh, uh, defined culture the, the medium that you can culture them almost forever. And then you also allow the opportunity to do the, 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 the precision, uh, the genome editing, uh, even though the efficiency may not be as high as we like. And then, of course, uh, you already hear they can differentiate into all kinds of cells. I will focus on the um, hematopoietic cells for my talk. And probably just uh, uh, the quick one here. So now it is uh, possible to make the clinical and great uh, iPS cells, and that's uh, several companies are doing that, including uh, Nanza. Not that they use in the, the method that we, we uh, develop, you just use a cup of the, the plasmid funded by the NIH. So I believe that one is probably available for many academic investigators to use in the, the GMB quality of the cells. Uh, other than that, I don't know the exact uh, the status for approval for the FDA. 
Uh, and then, uh, as I said, the, some of the issues, IPS cells, they are actually uh, reasonably stable as the cells in culture that has been uh, expanded in culture for a long, long time. And uh, probably the last point I want to say here, uh, IPS cell provided the opportunity for individualized uh, disease that modeling. Keep in mind, and any two of us, even two males, we differ for at least four million single nucleotides. So this uh, genetic variation have a tremendous impact on the, uh, the, uh, the biological function of the cells you differentiate from the IPS cells. i just give you two uh, examples. The first uh, example is uh, we have been using the IPS cell as a model to monitor the uh, uh, polycythemia, uh, the viral or the other form of the myeloneoplasm uh, 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 containing the jak 2 v 617 f the mutation. It's a single point mutation. It's a gain of function that activated the uh, jak 2 for this uh, disease here. So. We, have, uh, we made the IPS cell a long time ago um, from the, the blood cell because of the mutation. It's pretty much the somatic uh, the mutation there. So I will not go to the, the detail that help us to understand uh, many things, including this mutation is necessary but not sufficient. That's the additional hit from this uh, the patient here. Uh, the other things that we noticed is a big variation of the, uh, uh, the function from the IPS cell. For example, in this particular study, we, have the, we generate the human IPS cell from more than 250 uh, individuals of the single uh, cohort, and then differentially into the hematopoietic stem and uh, the, the progenitor cells, and then we differentially into the, uh, the megacarry site here. So this is uh, some of the, uh, uh, the data I just want to show you. So data I show you here is only a sick data of either the IPS cell or the IPS cell derived megacarry site from seven individuals. Some of the individuals will generate multiple IPS uh, and uh, the cell line. This uh, clustering is, is basically show the diversity or divergence of the seminality of this one. If you generate IPS from the same individual at the IPS level, but on a sick, they are very, very similar. And then you, uh, you see the, the variation from one individual to another individual. Of course, the gene expression pattern of IPS derived megacarry site, and they are very different from those of the IPS cell. But this uh, similarity loses a little bit, but you still see the tremendous uh, the impact of the uh, genome of the individual here. So I just want to emphasize when you do the, uh, the modeling, you really have to consider what's the really the iso, uh, the, the, the genetic control, and that is the, the genome editing would provide the precise way to know the, whether the exact mutation is majorly responsible for the, the phenotype that we observed. So. Uh, uh, for our study, we pretty much focus on the hematopoietic cells. And, uh, the simple idea would be we have the human IPS cell, either from the autologous source, and, uh, that is a cell for the disease uh, the modeling uh, I mentioned to you, or from the, allo uh, the genetic source in, in order to be uh, broadly available or have the favorable uh, the, the donors to differentiate them into the hematopoietic stem and uh, the progenitor cells because we can do this uh, reasonably well. And even the inefficiency may not be as high as we like, we will be able to select the clone, the high-quality high quality clone, and then to, uh, before we differentiate of the cell to the many uh, the cell types. It's still very active ongoing research to generate this transplant of hematopoietic stem cell for the bone marrow transplantation. That's some uh, promising news from the investigators such as George Daly and others, but they still need to use in seven different antiviral vectors in order to uh, make them uh, engraft into the immunodeficient mice. At the same time, we may not need, for many other applications, we may not need the transplantable hematopoietic stem cells. We may generate the functional cell downstream 
such as T cells, such as NK cells. Uh, probably some of you just heard the talk from another session that's the uh, using the iPS derived NK cells as well as the, the T cells. So I will not go to the, the details of this uh, uh, exciting opportunities for the immuno uh, the therapy. I will share with you some of the, the data we had in the past several years for the uh, ether site as well as the mega carry site in order to generate a platelet. One reason that we're interested, not only there's a big need for the transfusion medicine, but also in these products, they do not have the, the nuclear eye. So every concern that we have for this very pluripotent stem cell, the safety, the possibility that may cause the cancer would be uh, uh, eliminated because the final product they do not have the, the nuclei. That's the, the rationale for, uh, for us and others try to, to generate this uh, the product. So I will not go through the, the details of the, this approach, and that is we have the footprinting integration free IPS cell line and then we try to push them into the hematopoietic stem and the, the progenitors, the megakaryocyte and the ethocyte. Just like all the frontiers of science, there's always the challenges uh, ahead of us. So in the past about five years, we made the progress for these two major the, the challenges. One is to make the mature uh, red blood cell that, that they no longer have the, the nuclei that are called uh, uh, enucleation. Second, to express the adult form of the, the, the globin here. So uh, we use the two different uh, the cell lines as the experimental system. One from the normal adult bone marrow cells called the BC1. Uh, second one is called the TNC1. It's derived from the periphery uh, blood of the sickle cell disease, uh, the patient here. We pretty much have the same uh, the result. And after several years, we simplified the, our differentiation system uh, by using the complete uh, zero-free, uh, animal protein-free uh, expansion, uh, the, the, the differentiation system. The iPS cell are expanded with a EA medium on the vitro recombinant human vitro uh, the nectar. That is a complete, completely chemical defined uh, the medium. Then, we push them to the hematopoietic uh, the progenitor cells and uh, mimic the normal uh, developmental the, the process. That take about 11 to 14 days. Uh, during this process, we also expand the cell number about five to 10 fold. And then we push the cell committed to the aethroid uh, the lineage. And so that take uh, another 10 days. At the final stage, then we push them for the terminal uh, maturation. So this is uh, divided by three steps. Based on the assumption, we never have the single culture condition to, uh, to allow the cell to go through all the developmental uh, the process here. And I just show you that the first the, the step, that we allow them to form the so-called embryo the, the bodies after 11 to 14 days hematopoietic cells, and they are released out into the suspension, as you know. Uh, mature hematopoietic cells, and they are the, the suspension cells. They, we have the CD45 and the CD34 positive cells. The good news for the hematopoietic system, probably also true for m many other systems, all these markers that have been validated, they pretty much express um, and from the iPS cell, derived cell as well. They give us a very good uh, the marker and uh, the reference to know we really get w what we are supposed to be. Gene expression, of course, is a much more uh, complicated uh, the issue here. So um, this cell, as I mentioned, the, the cells that we have based on this system, as I mentioned already, the transplantation activity is very poor as compared to the, cord, uh, the blood or the bone marrow cells we, uh, we get from the uh, adult. We have the multiple lineage of the myeloid cells. Uh, this cell can generate the NK cells. Dan Kaufman is uh, the leader to generate the iPS cell or ESL and derived NK cells. So uh, for us, we more focus on the, the red blood cell and the megakaryocyte. side. Uh, this would be the, the second uh, step, using combination of the cytokines 
then we push them to the uh, e throat, uh, the blood cell. During this process, the cell can proliferate about 10 to uh, uh, the 50-fold in 10 days. Uh, but they also um, gradually uh, differentiate into the reddish, uh, uh, the aethocyte, as you can see the, the color here. And then we uh, change the medium again, using the high concentration of the transferrin and other things to push them to the terminal uh, uh, differentiated aethocyte. During this process, that lasts about eight to 10 days, the cell proliferates for another three to four uh, divisions similar to uh, what is uh, happening in vivo. And then uh, you can see uh, cells express a high level of beta globin as uh, stained by the, uh, uh, the benzidine here, as well as the, some of them no longer have the, the nuclei. So this is the, the product of the terminal differentiation for eight to 10 days. Uh, you can see this donut uh, shape of the cell. They no longer have the, uh, the nuclei. Otherwise, they should stay in the, the blue here. And uh, obviously, they are very, very uh, the reddish when you spin up this cell down in the, the PBS. Uh, and this is another way to show the markers, such as glycophorin A positive. And there's always a few percent of the cell that still express the CD45, could be the, uh, the microphages here. And they do not have the, the nuclei if you're using the cell permeable in the DNA dye staining here. So typically we have a five to 10% of the cell and they no longer have the, the nuclei in the culture uh, the system that we have. We have been using this uh, the system. I know it is not perfect, but we thought it's uh, useful to do some of the disease the modeling, hopefully in the future for the genetic disease treatment. In this case, uh, we're targeting the beta thalassemia and the sickle cell disease. As most of you in the audience, then you know, uh, these two uh, diseases are due to the genetic uh, the mutation in the adult form of the globin, that is beta uh, the globin. Beta globin is normally only turned on during the birth, so that you have the live birth of the child, but they normally uh, develop the symptoms such as anemia after birth. So we um, actually have been doing this for a long, long time. Now looking back, we have been doing it for more than 10 days, uh, 10 years, sorry. That's, uh, so a basic idea is to how to correct the endogenous uh, the mutation in the, the genome in the human cells. Uh, so I will not go through of this one. Uh, suffice to say, we're using the targeted nucleus to make a double strand the brick and then to trigger the endogenous DNA repair or misrepair uh, the system here. Uh, one is non homologous and the, the, the joining, as you know, that's uh, uh, much more efficient but also created uh, the mutation. Second one is a more uh, precise way that is called the homology and directed the repair. Uh, most of you already know this. So the key initially, the rate limiting step is really to find the sequence specific nucleus we can cut at the, the, the precise location. Uh, looking back, that's probably more than 10 years ago, together with uh, Morgan when she was uh, a student with uh, Keith Jung, uh, with Matt Proteus as well as uh, George Daly. Uh, we used the zinc finger nucleus and published, published the first paper in the human iPS cells. I forgot it's 2009 or 2010, but that sounds like a long, long time ago. And then, of course, uh, the, this field moved very, very fast. Before we published our paper about the talent, uh, CRISPR already came out. And uh, I don't need to uh, introduce the CRISPR to this audience. Suffice to say, we're using the system uh, in the past uh, five years. Uh, six years, the one that uh, provided by Prashant um, uh, Malley, when he developed this in the George Church's uh, laboratory, that uh, he was a PhD uh, student in my laboratory and a uh, significant contributor for the papers we published previously. 
And uh, then you can see that uh, CRISPR is definitely much more efficient than the zinc finger nucleus, as well as a talent, particularly for the non homologous and uh, the joining when we test them in the, this sequel cell the mutation here. And the, I probably just make one comment, uh, and, and that is about after target one. Of course, it will not never be perfect. Uh, of course, you will see a lot of non homologic and the joining when you test them in the cancer cell lines, such as 293 cells, such as the K562 cell, when you load tons of the nucleus and the guidon into the cells. Uh, 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 but when you move on to the really the bi uh, biologically relevant cell, the challenge is still how to do that efficiently. And actually, alpha target is not as bad. Uh, and to our uh, expectation. So uh, when we uh, test them in the human iPS cell, as well as uh, Karen and uh, Chad Cohen published the paper uh, almost at the same time, that we compare both talent as well as CRISPR in the human iPS cell. And that is the alpha target mutation is really at the, uh, the uh, the base level that is not significant and higher than the sponta spontaneous mutation that you could have just by expanding the iPS cell at the common level. And then not only the whole genome sequence, but also we did uh, the target uh, the sequencing as well. So with this level of confidence, we move on to do the gene targeted sequel cell the, the mutation. As you know, the sequel cell is a single point uh, the mutation. A to T change the codon of the number six, and then uh, and we repeat what we did in the past with the zinc finger nucleus. Uh, it is much more efficient. We can uh, restore the an, a normal HBB uh, expression, even though the whole system, the beta globin expression, is still about 10% of the total beta globin expression. 90% of the uh, beta globin is the gamma form, and that is the fetal form. So that uh, has been maybe useful for the future clinical application, but is not ideal for the disease modeling. It's because we always have the gamma form uh, expression from the iPSL derived uh, aethocytes. And uh, the, the cells uh, appear to be functional at least in vitro by um, binding the oxygen. That's no different from the one from the court, uh, the blood. Uh, and then uh, subsequently we using this uh, CRISPR to correct the beta thalassemia, uh, the, uh, the patient. Uh, as you know, this is a typical uh, recessive uh, mutation. That is a mutation could happen in anywhere in this, uh, uh, the locus containing the three axons here. And uh, the most, Common one, at least in the south part of China, this is this is three um, different uh, mutations here. So, it would be tremendously difficult for each of the patient. You come up with the CRISPR uh, targeting this mutation, and then you have the template. So we thought, can we find a universal way that cover the majority of the beta thalassemia patient? Uh, and that is, if we can make the correction as early as possible, the exon 1, and then put the, the cDNA as the mini-gene to, uh, to express uh, the, the form of the uh, adult form of the, the globin here. So by testing the principle, we use in two beta thalassemia patients uh, from China. This is the age of the two patients, and uh, this is the, the mutations in both uh, an, uh, anneal of the HBB, uh, the gene here. So t using the same um, gu guideline that we previously used for the sequel cell, that we targeted uh, here and then put uh, the seeding here. To prove the principle, we're also targeting the GAP downstream. That is not only we express the HPB, the Y type, but also co-express the EGAP so that we can monitor them more efficiently. Also as the model that in the future, we may be able to express any uh, exogenous pro protein in the terminally uh, uh, differentiated cells. Uh, since the paper is published, so I will not go through the detail. Basically, it worked to the efficiency from the, 
from the iPS cell here. And for the iPS cells, really the efficiency is not a major issue because you can always find the clones that you want. Uh, so uh, that's uh, uh, the, the result, not only the, the Y type, but also two iPS cell nine derived from the beta thalassemia, the, the patient here. So, and, and of course, that's a still a long way to go. Uh, before we are able to generate the transplantable hematopoietic stem cell for transplantation, this technology may be able to generate the mature uh, red blood cell for the purpose of the transfusion, so that um, at least for this chronic transfusion dependent patient, then the challenge is how to scale up, right? Probably true for any clinical applications, particularly true for the red blood cell. I had a very brave PhD student from the chemical engineering department that uh, he made the effort and we have the home uh, made uh, instrument. At this moment, we can, each batch we can make four times 10 to the ninth cell. It's still about 0.2% um, of the, the uh, red blood cell in the one bag for the transfusion purpose here. So that's still a long way to go if we really try to replace the donor-based transfusion here. So I pretty much mentioned all the, the key part. My laboratory still tried to make the effort using the genome, combined with the genome editing to make a more younger and a better red uh, the blood cell. For example, the red blood cell lacking all the major uh, the blood antigen. They may live longer and they may gain additional function. Additional function would be, for example, can we use the, the red blood cell to deliver the, um, the biological uh, in, so that this can circulate longer. I, this would be the hope someday we will be able to generate the multiple uh, uh, the blood cell, red blood cell, uh, platelet, and the T cells in the, the laboratory with uh, enhanced uh, the function here. And then, of course, uh, and this all uh, the key, uh, the personnel in my uh, the laboratory, the, the current uh, members or who recently left, as well as the previous lab members such as uh, Prashant and the collaborators, including Keith Jung and uh, his colleague, Matt Protest, uh, George Daly, and others. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, so I have a small question here. So in your study, you used the different strategies to induce the iPS cells into like mature NK cells and T cells. Do you have some uh, experiment to say like those NK cells uh, and T cells have function in the uh, studies? Um, I guess I'm not qualified to answer your question. I hope you attended uh, another one uh, in uh, another session. Um, and so based on my understanding of the work done by Fate and Therapeutics as well as by Michel Sardinet, uh, they ha have the functional NK cells and the T cells uh, that derive from the human iPS cells. Okay, because in your study I just saying that like, you use the uh, biomarkers and use fact sorting to say that like, those mature cells are NK cells and T cells. So I think you should have some experiment to say that those cells are functional. Uh, I agree with you. And, yeah. uh, and we, my laboratory is not an expert on the NK cells and the T cells. Yes, I fully agree with you. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our session is closed. Enjoy the rest of the meeting.